uh, verse 27 to 31. It says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him, and they put a a scarlet robe on him, and twisted together a crown of thorns that they put on his head, and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him, and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, and put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you have written to us all these things. And we pray as we open your word this morning that the Holy Spirit will guide us and help us to understand the things that you have written. We pray that you will fill our hearts with them, that we might meditate upon them, that we might allow them to cause us to change, to understand your character and our relationship with you better. And we just ask that you be with us this morning. Help us to hear your word and to understand it. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus is turned over to the Roman soldiers for crucifixion. If you remember last week, Evan reminded us that at this time, Rome was in complete control of all of Israel. They occupied by force. Israel, as a result, uh, hated the Roman conquerors. And the Roman soldiers, the Roman conquerors, had complete disdain for the people of Israel. This was not a um, great relationship. And so the Roman soldiers are taking away this man who they understood to have claimed to be the king of the Jews. And so for the Roman soldiers, this is an opportunity to mock this king. It was an opportunity for the soldiers to say, hey, you Jews, this is your king. And let us show you that your king is no match for the mighty Roman Empire. This is an opportunity for them not to just do their job of crucifixion, but to make point in the process that they, Rome, were greater than Israel. And so they took this opportunity. They took this as the chance for them to show that the king of the Jews was not a match for the great Roman emperor. And so the soldiers stripped Jesus out of his clothes. They put on a royal robe. It was probably the cape of a uh, an officer, a Roman officer, because that would have been what they had at hand. It was probably an old one. It wasn't one they would have just taken off one of the soldiers. It would have been one they had lying around, so they put that on him. They take a branch or branches from a thorn bush. They fashion it into a crown for this king, and they put it on his head, driving the thorns into his skull. They put a reed in his hand so that he would be a proper king. And then they knelt down before him and they mocked him. And they said, oh, hail, king of the Jews. Oh, you mighty king, aren't you great? And they all spit on him and they hit him and they beat him. And it wasn't enough for what he had gone through already at the hands of the Jewish leaders. But now he was in the hands of men who truly hated him. And they did this in their great fashion as Roman soldiers. These were men whose job it was to kill people. And they were good at it. And in the midst of all this abuse and all this mocking, Jesus doesn't speak. He didn't speak at his trial either one of them, 
And he doesn't speak before the soldiers either. Why? Because he is perfectly submitting to his father's will. He knew what was coming. He had read Isaiah. He knew what the suffering servant was going to go through. And he was prepared to go through that without crying out and without saying anything. He had determined, if you remember, the night before that he would submit to God's will as it came without trying to change anything. He would be obedient no matter what. The soldiers then take the robe off of him. They put his clothes back on and the one one, uh, kindness that they show to him that he doesn't have to carry the cross to Golgotha naked. And then they take him out to crucify him. If we go to chapter or to verse 32, let me read it for us. It says, As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. As they went out, as they left the city and exited the gate of the city is what Uh, Matthew is most likely saying and as they come to that point they exit the city heading to Golgotha and Jesus would have been carrying his cross or at least the cross member of the of the cross and he would have been carrying that on his shoulders that was the uh, punishment part of the punishment for those who were condemned And at this point, as he gets to the gate, he's unable to carry it further. He can't go anymore. And so they constrict a a man. They come and grab this guy out of the crowd. And we're told his name is Simon. He's from Serene. I looked that up. That's a long way off from where Jerusalem is. But he's there probably for the Passover to celebrate. And they drag him and they put the the cross or the cross beam on him and force him to carry the cross. The procession takes its way out of the gate and up the hill. This is the one of the main roads leading out of Jerusalem. And as you go along the road, then it would take you past Golgotha, a place of a skull. And the soldiers offered Jesus wine mixed with gall there. And I looked that up. Gall is um, the term for the bile of an animal's bladder. And so I I, I did some reading about it, you know, and I, I ain't no expert in this, but you read it and it says it was either put in food or drink to make it unedible because it would taste so horrible. Or maybe it was creating some kind of a narcotic to um, cause there to be less pain. But to me, I go, that doesn't sound like a Roman soldier. Here, let's do something nice. We'll take away your pain. No, it would sound to me like they would have done something that would have been more painful, more discomfort, more untenable for for the prisoner, for the condemned. But either way, they offered this wine to him. And when Jesus tastes it, he refuses it, choosing instead to be completely in control of all his faculties, to completely know what's going on. He doesn't hide any of what he's facing. He takes it full force, right at the brunt. He doesn't turn away from any of it. 
And the cru- crucifixion itself is a relatively quick process. The condemned is either tied or nailed to the crossbeam, and their feet are nailed to the standard, and the crucifixion is complete. All there is is waiting to die. And the dying is what takes a long time. Dying of crucifixion could take four days. It depends on how strong you are. It depends on what else is going on in your body. It depends on how able you are to continue to breathe because most people die of asphyxiation. It's why the Roman soldiers would come by and break the legs of the condemned. Because in order to breathe while you're hanging on a cross, you have to lift your body up. And you did that by pressing your feet up to lift yourself up. So by breaking your leg, you're no longer able to do that and it causes you to die faster. But it was over. The crucifixion was done. And Matthew doesn't really go through a lot of details of the crucifixion. If you want to read about it in Scripture, you don't find much. You have to go to the, the encyclopedias or to the commentaries or to the other places to find out. And there's a reason for that. Because the crucifixion is not the point. Yes, Christ died on a cross, and that was to fulfill prophecy, but the crucifixion itself is not the point. The point that Matthew wants us to see and understand is that Jesus died for your sins. How he died is not really the most important thing. He died the way all prisoners in Rome, who were not Roman citizens, would die for their sin, whatever their crime was. If they were convicted of death, most of them were crucified if they weren't Roman citizens. Very few Roman citizens were crucified. But Jesus here is crucified, and the purpose of it is to kill him. And that's what Matthew wants us to understand, that Jesus' death is what's important. The soldiers divide his clothes. Some of them they tore into pieces so that they would each get some, but it tells us that his outer garment they gambled away so that it wouldn't be damaged. And all of this was fulfilling the prophecy about Christ. And then Matthew tells us that they sat down to watch. And when you first read that, you go, that's kind of a morbid thing, isn't it? Here are the soldiers who sit down to watch this guy die. But remember that the soldiers are responsible for the death of the condemned. Should the condemned be rescued from the cross, should the condemned somehow find their way off and become free, the soldiers would pay with their life. Their life would be taken in place of the one who they were supposed to be executing. And so the soldiers weren't allowed to leave until the condemned was dead. So they sat down to wait for the death of Christ. They were there to see the very end. And then Matthew tells us, uh, almost in a a kind of casual manner, oh, and by the way, there were two other guys who were hung with Jesus. There were two other guys who were killed along the way. The one who's on the right and the one who's on the left. And it's almost an afterthought of Matthew. And he tells us that Pilate put a sign over Jesus. Now the sign would have been written and hung around Jesus' neck as he walked to his crucifixion. And the sign would have told what his crime was. So the two thieves would have had a sign that said, I'm a thief. 
Jesus' sign says, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And that's what the sign said. And when they get to the cross and they hung them, they would put the sign up over their head so that everyone who walked by would not only know that you were being crucified, that you were being executed, but they would know what your crime was. So they would be able to see. Remember, crucifixion, execution in this public way was not um, just for Jesus. This was common practice for the Romans. It was common practice for several other um, nations. And, and it was done as a deterrent. They wanted to make sure that everyone who went by said, if you're a thief, this is what's going to happen to you. If you're a, a murderer, this is what's going to happen to you. It was there as a deterrent, and it was intended to be publicly humiliating, and it was intended to be painful and to cause suffering because they wanted to make sure that everyone who saw you knew that if they decided they were going to do the same thing, they would suffer the same fate. And so the Romans made sure that everyone could see what was happening. And so now the crucifixion is over. And now it's just the waiting. Let's go on from there to to verse 39. It says, And those who passed by him derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also it says, the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in this way. So we see this this notation from Matthew as to the charges, the the mocking and and the comments that are made by people as they see him there. And it says that the people passing by would say, he's going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Surely you can save yourself. Right? Remember, we talked about that a few weeks ago, that that was one of the charges that was placed upon Jesus. That's not really what Jesus said. If you go back and read it, he said, you destroy this temple, meaning himself, and I'll rebuild it in three days. They all took it to mean the physical temple of Israel, and so they all mocked him and said, hey, you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it. You can't even get yourself off a cross. They take that as mockery of him. And then they go on and they say, if you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Why? Because the son of God would have power, wouldn't he? Power to overcome whatever man might do to him. And so they mocked him. And they said, if you're the son of God, then come down from the cross. If you can't come down from the cross, therefore, you must not be the Son of God. And third, then, the Jewish leaders mocked him. They they make fun of him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. Isn't it funny that they are, are making those comments? The things that they wanted to disavow while he was uh, uh, alive and on the streets... They now affirm he saved others, but he can't save himself. Then they go on, he was the king of Israel. Let him see him, let us see him come off the cross, and then we'll believe in him. If you do something, then we'll believe in you. And lastly, the thieves are in there as well. If you trust in God, Let's see God save you. If God really wants you, let's see him take you off the cross. 
go back almost two years now. Back in January of 2023, we were in Matthew 4. And Jesus was there being tempted by Satan. Remember that? And the evil one kept saying to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, then do this or do that. Do you remember that? We talked about that. Don't you see a similarity here in all this mocking of Jesus, even here while he's on the cross? The evil one is still taunting him. The evil one is still there saying, if you're the son of God, prove it. Prove who you are. And the people are joining right in. They're they're going right along with him. And he's still bringing this same, same tired statement to Jesus. If you're the son of God, prove it to us. The interesting things as we look at this is that all of these statements, just as they were in chapter 4 of Matthew, about Jesus are absolutely true. Right? Look at the first one. The temple. Jesus will be destroyed on the cross. Physically, he's going to die. But in three days, he will rebuild the temple because he will rise from the dead. The Holy Spirit will fill his followers and we will become the temple of God. Not a physical temple anymore. A spiritual temple that will never be taken away. That will never be destroyed. That will never be defeated because we become God's temple. Isn't that awesome? The very thing that they're mocking Jesus about is the absolute truth of who he is and what he's going to do. Then they said to him, come down off the cross. Jesus will come down off the cross. And he will rise again from the dead. He will overcome death. Just as he said he would. Just as they mocked about him. So he will do. And Jesus will not only save himself. But he will bring salvation to all the nations. Just as God promised to Abraham. He is the promised one. He is the Messiah. And when he comes down off the cross and is buried, he will rise again and bring salvation to all who follow him. And it's available to anyone. And the interesting thing is the the Pharisees cry out at him and say, you're the king of Israel. If you come off the cross, we'll believe you. The reality is, Jesus staying on the cross shows he is the king, and all who believe in him will follow him. Not those who don't believe, which is who the Pharisees were, but those of us who believe in Jesus, who have faith in him, will receive salvation, and we will be saved by him. And lastly, Jesus did trust God. And God did save him. And he rose from the dead by the power of God. And with him, so we conquer death as well. Right? We're not going to suffer death because we will be with God forever. Jesus brings that to us. All the mockings that were made about Jesus Christ were true about Jesus Christ. But the people who were saying them were simply in such disbelief of him that they couldn't see it. And only those who trust in God will be able to see those things. You know, I thought about this over the last couple of weeks. And I thought, if we live like Jesus, 
If we imitate him in the way we speak, in the way we act, in our thoughts, then we too are going to be mocked by the world. We're going to be made fun of. We're going to be teased. We're going to be called goody two-shoes. Everyone's going to make fun of us and tease us about who we are and how we live and why we do those things. And at some point, if they haven't already said it to you, they're going to begin to say to you, Hey, you Christian. Hey, you little Christ. Where is this Messiah of yours? You've been telling us for 2,000 years that he's coming again. Where is he? Why isn't he here? Maybe he's never coming. They're going to mock you. And they're going to make fun of you. In some places of this world, they're going to just kill you. But here, you go, well, I won't be killed. No, I think it's worse. We get made fun of. We get teased into silence. We get made fun of and mocked until we won't say anything because we don't want to be made fun of anymore. And I thought, how do we overcome that? And you know how we overcome that? We overcome that by prayer. You go, how do I overcome that? Why? By prayer. And so I was thinking about that and I went back to Acts. And in Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 30, the believers are before the um, Sanhedrin and and. The apostles are there, and they're told to stop speaking about Jesus, or they're going to be in big trouble. It's kind of the way it came across, you know. You're going to be in big trouble if you don't stop saying that, right? So they go back to the rest of them, and listen to what it says. In verse uh, 23 of chapter 4 of Acts, it says, When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Please, God, don't let them hurt us. Wait, that's not what it said. Sorry. That was the world's version. Here's what it says. Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness. That's what they prayed. They didn't pray to be hidden away. They didn't pray to be taken out of the situation. They said, give us the strength to continue to speak boldly for you. You want to know how to counter Satan and his mocking and his his teasing and his threats? Pray to God to make you bold. To say, make me bold. Let me speak out for you. Let me shout it from the mountaintop. Let me not be quiet. No matter what I face. No matter what's coming. No matter what I have to suffer. Make me bold. Paul said the same thing. He was praying and he said to his uh, followers to, to the people he is writing to. He said, pray also for me that I might speak the truth. Pray also for me that I might do what God has called me to do. You see, our defense against Satan is not to hide or run away. Our defense is to look to Jesus Christ and say, make me bold. Make me be the person you want me to be. Give me the voice that I need to have and don't let me be shy. And the second thing is, 
How do we respond in the face of persecution? The world will tell us, stand up for yourself. Don't let them push you around. But that's completely opposite of what Jesus did. Jesus didn't care about being pushed around. He didn't care about being made fun of. He didn't care even about death. He cared about doing the will of God. He cared about being who God sent him to be. He says in John chapter 4, my food is to do the will of the Father who sent me. He came to earth to do his will. Guess what? We are here to do the will of the Father who sends us. That's our job. It's to go out and bring glory and honor to God even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of the things that come about as a result of those who are opposed to God. We are there to bring glory and honor to God. And we need to do what Paul tells us to do in Galatians 5. Verses 22 and 23. He says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, there is no law. That's who we're called to be. We're called to be bold, to stand up in the face of of persecution and to live like Jesus lived. Not to be mighty warriors and wield great uh, armies against the evil one the way the world would, but to be mighty warriors who wield the word of God in joy and peace and faithfulness, kindness to be who Jesus Christ was. We need to pray to God that he will make us bold to speak out and to live and to show the fruit of his Holy Spirit in our lives. That's what we need to do. And to do that, we need to be ready ahead of time. We need to make that determination. Remember, Jesus, the night before he was crucified, determined that he would do the will of the Father no matter what. We need to wake up every day and say, today, God, make me bold to do your will no matter what. Are we ready? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your word. God, we see in Jesus the mighty warrior who said nothing, did everything according to your will, who accepted what he was required to accept, and he accepted it on our behalf. God, help us to be bold this week. Help us to stand up and speak the truth about Jesus, to live our lives according to the fruit of the Spirit, to be the people you've called us to be. God, help us to do the things you have for us to do. You have prepared them in advance for us to do them. God, help us to do them well this week. We ask all this in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen.